Lion's Sight. Services for the blind and visually impaired. Graphic of a lion's head in black and white on a gray background. Okay, we're now going to do the shared read aloud. She was the first. The Trailblazing Life of Shirley Chrisholm. So let's take a look at the cover. We see Shirley Chrisholm. And what's this building she's in front of? Can anyone tell me? And what sign is she making with her hands? Go ahead and pause the video and talk amongst yourselves. Some of you might think that this is the White House. It's not. This is Capitol Hill. It's part of the government, and the White House is a government building, but it is not the White House. This is Capitol Hill. This is where Congress meets. This symbol, some of you might know it, it looks like the peace sign. But actually, when you hold it up with both your hands, like this, it's the victory sign. It's a sign that people show when they win an election. Let's go ahead and begin with the summary of the book. And we can talk a little bit about what we think this book is going to be about. Shirley liked to be in charge. As a young girl at home and at school, she liked to do things her way. In college, anyone who opposed her on the debate team. After graduating, Shirley became an educator and a community activist, standing up for the rights of women and people of color. Her small stature and fiery determination often took people by surprise, but they listened. In 1964, Shirley brought her voice and leadership to politics. As the first black woman to serve in the New York State Assembly and later as the first black woman elected to Congress, she championed gender and racial equality, educational programs, and the needs of the poor. Then, in 1972, Shirley shared her ideas with voters nationwide. She became the first black person to seek the presidency of the United States as a major party candidate. Shirley Chrisholm, a woman of many firsts, was a legendary political trailblazer whose legacy is a beacon for the diverse leaders of today. Here is her inspiring story. What does it mean to be a trailblazer? What does that sound like to you? All right. Let's get on with the book. I'm going to take a quick sip of water. All right. She was the first. The Trailblazing Life of Shirley Chrisom by Catherine Russell Brown. Illustrations by Eric Vlasquez. And here's a picture of Shirley Chrisholm. She looks like she's very focused, like she's looking off into the distance at something. All right, here's from the author. To anyone who's dreaming of doing something that other people say is silly or impossible, go ahead and try. Create your own path and be a trailblazer like Shirley Chrisholm. And here's a note from the illustrator. For Shirley Chrisholm and the often overlooked people of the West Indian community who have made valuable contributions to American history and culture. All right, we've got a two page spread. So I'm going to make sure you guys see the whole image. And then we're going to begin reading. On a cold November day in 1924, Shirley Anita St. Hill came into the world. Back then, 
Nobody had an inkling that she would open a door to history. Surely, the oldest of the St. Hill girls was a handful for mother and papa. From the time she was little, Shirley liked to be in charge. At three, she was already leading children twice her age around the neighborhood, telling them where to go and which games to play. Listen to me, Shirley said, and they did. Here's Shirley at the front. She looks very feisty, young and excited. She's got a little baton. And here are the other children playing around with her. Over on the left hand side, there's a young child in a red wagon being pulled and pushed by another child. Real quick, 1924, that's when Shirley Chrisholm was born. What year is it today? Shirley Chrisholm would be 100 years old today, almost 100 years old. It's 2022, turning 2023. So Shirley Chrisholm would be 99 years old if she was still alive today. So. I want you to think about the time period. The time period provides information. We call that context. Think about the time that she is from and the context that time has on Shirley Chrisholm's life. We can see the family. There's Mama, Shirley, her younger sister. Here's Papa with the younger child. The St. Hill family lived in Brooklyn, New York. Papa was a baker's helper and mother was a seamstress and domestic worker. They barely earned enough money to keep food in the cupboards and supper on the table. Mother and Papa made a tough decision. They would send the girls to live with mother's family on the Caribbean island of Barbados. While the children were away, Papa and mother would save their money and Shirley and her sisters would get a taste of country living. Let's take a look at this house. It's a very plain home. It's an old apartment in New York. And you can see that there's not much in it. There's a sink, a table, and some cupboards and there's not much in the house and they're having a hard time feeding the family. Think about how that would change the way it is you grow up if you can't just go to the cupboard and grab a snack whenever you want. Okay, we're in a new location. Let's take some time to look at the picture. There's some trees in the background. And what kind of trees are these? What do these trees look like? There's one on the far right as well. What kind of tree is that? Do they have those kinds of trees in New York? Those are palm trees. Do they have those kinds of trees in New York? So this is somewhere else. This is Barbados. And palm trees only grow in warm climates. So let's take a look. Let's learn more about Barbados. In 1928, Shirley, her sisters, and mother boarded an ocean liner named the Volcania. After nine rocky days at sea, they arrived in Barbados. From the port, they rode in a rickety bus to Grandmother Emmeline's farm. Shirley spotted her grandmother right away. The thin West Indian woman stood as tall as a reed, and she looked like serious business. Here's Grandma. She's got her hands on her hips and she's looking straight ahead, focused. And here's Mother, the two children, and the baby. And Grandma's looking at her daughter, and Grandma's looking at her grandchildren. And so Grandma is taking on a bunch of responsibility to help out the family. Here's all their belongings. It's a very different life they're going to, going from New York to Barbados. Big jump. <laughs> big jump. And we'll see how big of a jump it is. 
Let's take a second to look at the pictures. Here's the family. They're saying goodbye. And here is something called an outhouse. And we're about to learn about outhouses. <laughs> and let's take a look at Grandma's face. She looks very serious. She doesn't have a big happy smile. She's got that straight ahead look like she means business. Let's see what that means. Island life was nothing like city living. The days were hot as an oven, and every night Shirley heard an animal concert of chips, clucks, and moos. Excuse me, chirps, clucks, and moos. Her new home also had something Shirley had never seen, an outhouse. This is an outhouse, this wooden building. This is the stoop where you use the restroom. Now, this is very different because in New York, they have plumbing. But in Barbados, they don't have plumbing. So you go to the outhouse. It's a very different way of living. In addition, when you have plumbing and you go to the bathroom, it takes the waste away through the plumbing. In an outhouse, this part right here that you sit on top of lifts up. You get a shovel, and when this container fills up, you get a shovel, you dig a hole, and you bury the waste, which means you have to dispose of your own waste. It's very different. You don't have plumbing to take away your waste. You have to clean up after yourself, and it's very difficult. You have to dig a hole in the hot sun, and you have to bury your waste. It's not easy and it's pretty smelly. This is why grandma has such a serious face because Shirley is looking at this and it's a new experience for her and she has to learn that she's not going to have the same comforts of city life. She's going to have to learn how to work. She's going to have to learn the merit of hard work. All right. Mother stayed for a few months to make sure the girls were settled in. Then she had to go back to Brooklyn to help Papa. The day Mother left, everyone's face was wet with tears. She has to go back home to work to pay the bills. That's not an easy thing to do. Everyone in the family has a job. Shirley has to help clean up around the farm. Grandma is running the farm. And of course, Mama has to go back home to New York to earn money so that one day she can bring her children back home. It's not an easy life. It's a life full of hard work and challenges. Let's look at some of the hard work that Shirley had to do. Let's also look at some of the rewards she got for doing that hard work. Let's look at these pictures. On the left we have a photo of Shirley. She's in a pink dress and she's holding a very heavy bucket of water and she's next to a well. You draw fresh water from a well. You can't just go to the sink and get tap water from the sink. They don't have plumbing. Here she is feeding a pig. And here she is hanging out with a cow. And here she is on the beautiful Barbados beach. And look, more palm trees. It's a very different kind of living. Let's read about it. Grandmother Emmeline's house was stocked with love, rules, and chores. Fetch the well water. That's what she's doing there. Feed the animals. That's what she's doing there with the pigs. Graze the cows. That's what she's doing over there in the cow pen. When they finished, Shirley, her sisters, and her cousins enjoyed a special treat. They raced to the beach, ran through the sand, and jumped into the clear blue water. To Shirley, the ocean felt like warm magic. Here's Shirley with all of her cousins and other family members, and they're playing around in the ocean. Now take a moment to think about it. Do you think that the water near New York is warm or cold? It's probably very cold, because New York is north. It's further north, and the further north you go, the colder it gets. The 
further south you go, the warmer it gets. Barbados is close to what we call the equator, which is the part of the planet that sticks out the most, is closest to the sun, and is the warmest year round. So she really enjoys the warm climate. Let's find out more about that. Let's find out more about Barbados. Let's look at this picture on the left first, then we'll look at the one on the right. Let's take some time to think about this picture before we read about it. What does this look like to you? Looks like a schoolhouse to me. There's a teacher, there's a blackboard, the teacher is pointing to the writing on the blackboard. All of the students are sitting in desks and they have books in front of them. So it's very much a school. But let's see how their school is different from yours. Let's just take a look. What kind of desks are they sitting at? Do they have individual desks or rows of desks? They have rows. There's four of them per row. So no one has their own individual chair. No one has their own individual desk. They all share. Let's take a look at the bench that they sit on. Is there a back to the chair that they can lean on? There's no back to the chair. So you can't slouch in class the entire time. You have to sit up straight, nice and tall. Problem with that is it's pretty tough to sit up all day. It takes a lot of energy to sit up and concentrate. You can't lean back. You can't slouch. You have to sit up, listen, and pay attention. It takes a lot of discipline to do that. They're disciplining these children to be focused so that they can learn to work hard. Also, let's take a quick minute and let's count the number of students. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Now just in this front area, area there's about 19, maybe 20 students. But let's read about it. The local school was a one-room building with more than 100 children ages 4 to 11. The teachers were strict and punished students who did not behave. Shirley was a fast learner. She could read and write well before she turned 5. Let's think about that for a minute. There's 100 students in a one-room building from ages 4 to 11. That's a lot. That's a hundred kids. That's a lot of kids. How many kids are in your class? Probably not a hundred. Why don't you take a chance to count how many kids are in your class? Think about how it would change the room if there were a hundred kids in your class and one teacher. Let's also take a look at the ages, ages 4 to 11. Generally, usually, mostly, in America, schools pair students by age. You have 10 and 11 year olds, you know, 11, 12 year olds. But you don't usually have four-year-olds and 11-year-olds together. That's a big difference. Their classes are very different. The teachers were strict and punished students who did not behave. It was a lot harder back then going to school. Let's look at the rest of Barbados and find out more about this unique place. Barbados was filled with people with brown skin like Shirley's. She saw teachers, preachers, and shopkeepers taking care of island business. Seeing them, Shirley understood that when she grew up, she could take charge and get things done too. So what this is showing is Shirley, she's in her school uniform with her school book, just like the book she's reading over here. She's got the same book, the same uniform. And here's a policeman. He's wearing a police uniform. 
he has the military uniform of a British officer. That is the British uniform, the hat and the uh, petticoat is what they call that, a petticoat. He's also got the chevrons. That's the shoulder markings. Those are called chevrons. And they tell you how high up you are in rank. So this guy is probably um, a sergeant or maybe a marshal, which means he's, he's an officer. He's not just a regular police officer. He's an officer within the military and in the police. It tells you a lot. So this is a high standing man and look at his skin and hers. They have the same colored skin. We're going to find out later on in the book why that's meaningful. Remember, this is happening in the 1920s. Shirley was born in 1924. And by this time, she's, I think, five or six years old. So it's probably just turning the 1930s. It's still a very different time period back then. Think about time and think about the context that time has on a story. When we talk about context, we're talking about the details and ideas and events around the story. All right, let's move on. Oh, now we're going to see the difference between Barbados and New York. What do you see in this picture? Snow. Do you think it snows in Barbados? No, it don't. <laughs> it does not snow in Barbados. So going from the hot Caribbean sun to the freezing New York cold winter. Oh, boy. That's a big change. That's a big change. Seven years went by. Mother and Papa were still struggling to earn money. The Great Depression of the 1930s made it hard for them to find steady jobs. But no matter, Mother wanted her girls back home. In 1934, the year Shirley turned 10, she and her sisters moved back to Brooklyn and to a different life. The city was crowded with automobiles, tall buildings, fast-moving people, and a confusing maze of streets. During the icicle cold winters, Shirley shivered thinking about the warm Barbados sunshine. There are blizzards, absolute blizzards in New York. This is what a blizzard looks like, a massive snowstorm. So it's pretty crazy going from the Caribbean sun and nice palm trees and warm water and beaches to freezing snow. And then you're out in the countryside in Barbados. Everything's spread out. You have farm animals. You don't have plumbing, but you've got a lot of space, a lot of room. Then you're in New York, which is a concrete jungle. What do you think that means? A concrete jungle. How do you think a concrete jungle is different from an actual forest jungle? How do you think they're similar? Think about it. All right, let's keep going. Now let's look at the classroom. Now we're looking at an American classroom in the 1930s. This is pretty interesting. This classroom is very different as well, because in this classroom, let's take a look. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten students. There's probably anywhere between 10 to 20 students in this class. Remember that when she was in Barbados, the class had a hundred students and had one room for a hundred students. I bet at this school in New York there are many rooms and there's only a handful of students in each one of those rooms. 
the rooms are bigger, there's more rooms, and the classes are smaller, and there's more classes. Let's also look at the desks. Everyone has a desk, their own desk. They're not sitting in rows. The desks have a back to them, so you can sit in the chair and you can kind of lean into the chair. You don't have to sit upright every time with your back straight, shoulders back, head up, neck facing forward, stiff as a board. Instead, you can kind of sit in your chair. It's a very different kind of environment. It's not as strict. All right. Thanks for looking at the picture with me. Let's read the next section. At her new school, Shirley got a sad surprise. Instead of starting sixth grade, she was put back into fourth grade. Shirley's schooling in Barbados had been excellent, but the teachers in Brooklyn said she didn't know enough U.S. history. Shirley was upset and embarrassed and bored. Sometimes, when the teacher wasn't looking, Shirley threw spitballs and snapped rubber bands at the younger kids in her class. One, once her teachers realized why Shirley misbehaved, the school gave her a tutor. In time, Shirley learned all the history she needed to catch up with her classmates. Take a look at this. Here's Shirley working with a tutor. Here's another difference between New York and Barbados. Remember that the school in Barbados had one teacher. Here in New York there are many classrooms with many teachers and the classes are smaller but not only are there many teachers in many classes there are extra teachers who are called tutors and they work with you outside of class to help you get caught up on work. So there are many differences. In Barbados, there's fewer resources, and it's a bit stricter. It's a bit harder. In America, there's more resources. There's more to go around, and people share a bit more to help each other. It's very fortunate that Shirley Chrisholm got a tutor to help her out. Without that tutor, she probably would have struggled in school because she didn't know U.S. history. Not because she wasn't smart or wasn't capable, it's just that she had a different kind of education. Think about those differences and how sometimes it helps to have someone support you when you're behind on something. Okay, now we're looking at a photo with Papa and his children. These are the St. Hill girls. Education was important in the St. Hill home. The girls made regular trips to the library to borrow books. When holidays came, Shirley was sure to receive a book as a present. Every evening, the family dinner table came alive. Papa talked first. Shirley listened closely and asked questions as he discussed world events. Papa read three newspapers every day. He was full of information. So here's a new book, and I think it actually says The Grapes of Wrath. I might be reading that wrong. And um, here's some newspapers wrapped around the book. And that's how they wrapped presents back then in newspapers. Those were also the newspapers that Papa read. That's probably why he knew so much, because even though he was a baker's assistant, he was always reading and educating himself. That's why reading is so important. It opens the doorway to opportunity. When Papa's friend stopped by, Shirley stayed up late and listened through the bedroom door. The men talked for hours about world leaders and politics. Papa said everybody should be treated the same. Rich, poor, black, white. Papa's words stirred something inside Shirley. She started paying more attention to current events. So here's Shirley, and she's outside the door. And this is the area where the men would talk, the adults as well. And they would talk about events and politics. 
and Papa was able to talk about it because he was reading the newspapers. And here's Shirley listening to it. She's showing an interest. Let's see what happens. So now she's a bit older. She's grown up. All right. Let's see if I can get this in the frame for you all. There we go. In high school, Shirley earned top grades and was accepted at several colleges. She chose Brooklyn College, just a subway ride away from home. The school was bigger than any she had attended. There were so many students. Shirley loved her classes. Her brain buzzed with new information about other countries, foreign languages, and different cultures. She joined the Harriet Tubman Society, a club where she learned more about black history, and nobody was surprised when Shirley signed up for the debate team. She could out-talk anybody. After her schoolwork was done, Shirley enjoyed going to parties and dancing. So here's Shirley. She's in school. She's studying. Here's the university building, and this is the bell tower. It's traditional that old school universities have bell towers. It's kind of to remind you not only of the time, but the bell is also symbolic that your time at university is limited. So you better think about your hard work. You better think about your studies. You better think about what's lying ahead of you while you're there. But if you work hard, you also get to enjoy the benefits of hard work. Shirley, after doing her schoolwork, she would go to dances. Here's her at the debate team, and here's her at a dance contest with a trophy. So even though she worked hard, she also got to play and enjoy her time. Now we're going to learn more about her college education. This person is important. He's her mentor. This is going to be a little bit of an interesting one, but let's take a look at what's in his hand. Do you see what's in his hand? It's a white cane. Follow my finger. Do you see the white cane? And what's at the end of the white cane? A red tip. This is a cane that's used by the blind. The blind use these canes to travel outside in public independently. The cane lets them detect obstacles in their way and lets them continue their travel alone and independent at least as best as they can sometimes a blind person needs to ask for help but most of the time they try to be independent and this cane enables that this is a blind man but he's very dignified dignified means he's honored he is honorable that means he is very successful. He's got a nice suit on, he works in a fancy office, and he's a professor at a high-value university, a prestigious university. And he is mentoring Shirley. Now, if he's blind, can he see Shirley? And if he's blind, can he hear Shirley? He definitely cannot see her if he is blind. But just because you're blind doesn't mean you can't hear someone. So this professor, Professor Warsaw, who we're going to learn about in a moment, can't see Shirley, but he can hear her ideas. He can hear her thoughts. He can hear her words what it is she's thinking and then saying. And he can understand what it is she's chasing, what it is she's going after. And he's guiding her. Let's find out how important this is. Shirley wanted to use her education to make the country and the world better for everyone. But how? Her favorite teacher, Professor Warsaw, knew Shirley was a great debater he suggested she give politics a try. Shirley had doubts. She loved children, 
so she decided to be a school teacher instead of a politician. She would make a difference by helping children. After she finished college in 1946, Shirley had a hard time finding a job. Most doors were closed to her because she was black and because she was a woman. Plus, she was very short. Don't judge me by my size, Shirley insisted at an interview to be a nursery school teacher. Give me a chance. Shirley got the job. Here's Shirley working with a bunch of young children. And she's reading to them, kind of like how I'm reading to you. And she makes a point of saying that people were judging her based off of the color of her skin, her gender, and her physical size. And that's why we talked for a moment about Professor Warsaw. Warsaw did not judge her, partly because he couldn't see her, but I think also partly because he understood how to look past someone's physical characteristics to see who it is they are on the inside not who they are on the outside. When you look at someone from the inside, you are looking at their quality of character. And he saw a high quality of character in Shirley. The blind man saw character in Shirley. You may see with your eyes, but you perceive with your mind. He perceives that Shirley has character. That is why he mentors her and encourages her to go into politics. Let's find out if she actually listens to Professor Warsaw's advice. Take a sip of water just a second. During the day, Shirley worked with children. In the evening, she worked with community groups. Shirley noticed that the people with power and money didn't seem to care about folks who were poor. This bothered her. She remembered how it felt to be poor. She spoke up and tried to make a difference for the people who didn't have power or money. One time, Shirley encouraged the women in a local group to stand up to the men and demand respect. Another time she noticed that the officials in charge of the meeting were ignoring everyone waiting in line to ask questions. Shirley rushed to the front and made sure that everyone was allowed to talk. Here's Shirley Chrisholm. She's in her school teacher outfit. She's got a blazer on and a professional set of working clothes. Part of being respected is looking the part. She looks respectable. These other people are not as well off as her, but she uses her power, her resources, and her intelligence to speak on their behalf. These individuals have things to say, but they're not being heard. So Shirley is using all the resources at her disposal to speak on their behalf and to help them be heard. That's very powerful. Now let's find out where this goes. In the middle of all this work, Shirley found love. In 1949, she married Conrad Chrisholm. There's Conrad. There's a little picture of them in the corner. They're getting married. In 1949, she married Conrad Chrisholm a private investigator. He was handsome, smart, and crazy about Shirley. In the 1940s, excuse me, in the 1950s and 60s, Shirley joined many organizations. Some local leaders and politicians didn't like her ideas. They called her a troublemaker because she stood up for women and people of color. But the people who needed help were glad Shirley was on their side, fighting to make sure they were treated fairly. In 1964, Shirley's heart told her it was time to step into politics. She had a gift. People listened when she talked. Her words motivated them to action. 
Shirley decided to make to Shirley decided to take a chance and run for the New York State Assembly. She won. So here we see a picture of Shirley Chrisholm. She's again in a professional works outfit. She's standing at what appears to be a podium. You can see microphones in front of her. And behind her is a banner that says, Vote for Chris Holm for State Assembly. And she is speaking to what appears to be an audience. And she's telling them her ideas and how she will serve the people and how her ideas are in service of the people. Let's see how that goes for her. She won State Assembly. But let's see what she does now that she's won a position in government. What does she do for the people? All right, let's find out. After Shirley became an assemblywoman, she worked to help the people of New York. She helped pass laws to help sick people get the medicine they needed. She worked to make sure landlords kept the heat on in the winter. She worked to help people find jobs and raise pay for workers including those who clean houses like her mother. She worked to help poor students pay for college. Shirley didn't say or do things just to be popular. She fought for what she believed was right, not what was easy. She followed Grandmother Emmy Lynn's advice and always, always to speak the truth. So here's a person over here going to a pharmacist and she needs to get medicine. Shirley fought for this person's rights to get the medicine she needs. Here is a family, and they have a young child. The woman is in what appears to be called a shawl, S-H-A-L. It's a head wrap that's like a scarf, and it keeps you warm in the freezing cold winter. Remember, they're in New York. It's not Barbados anymore. There's no more beach, sunshine, and rainbows. They're in New York. It gets cold in New York. If you remember... If you remember, there's the blizzards that they used to see in New York. So it's very important that you have warm homes, especially with young children, because young children can get sick if they get too cold. So here's a young mother with her child, and she's wrapped up. This appears to be her husband, the father of the child, and he's wrapped up. But wrapping yourself up isn't enough. You need to be able to heat your home. It helps. Here we have a domestic worker, sometimes also called a maid, and she is cleaning a house. Shirley knows how hard this job is because her mother did it. So she's speaking up on behalf of this person to help make sure this person gets paid a fair wage for their work. And here are some college students. Shirley went to college and she worked very hard to get there. And these students probably worked very hard for their degrees. But what they needed was some financial support and Shirley helped them get the support they needed so they could get their degrees and help run society. Now let's see how, f how far she'll go, how much further she'll go with her politics, with her political career. This is a very interesting photo. Well, not photo, excuse me. This is a very interesting picture, a painting. We're going to discuss this in a moment, but I want you to take a look. There's a lot of people sitting in this area here called the foreground. It's the area closest to us, the viewer. These people in the foreground are facing Shirley. She's standing at another podium. And then there are these other layers where people are sitting. And in the very back is the executive area for the highest ranking officials. This is inside the Congressional Building. Shirley has made it all the way to Congress. And she is speaking inside Congress. Let's find out about that. Four years later, Shirley decided to run for the U.S. Congress. She promised to help people all across the country. Some of the men in Congress tried to keep Shirley out. They scolded her and said a woman didn't belong in politics. One of her opponents called her a little school teacher. Many people said they would never vote for a woman. Shirley dusted off the mean talk. She kept meeting with people and asking them to vote for her. 
Her campaign slogan was unbought and unbossed. We'll talk about what that means in a moment. Shirley's hard work paid off. In 1968, she was the first black woman elected to Congress. In the House of Representatives, Shirley kept her promise. She worked for laws that helped women, children, students, poor people, farm workers, native people, and others who were often pushed aside. She fought for health care. She spoke up for military veterans. She spoke out against war. Let's talk about her slogan real quick. Unbought and unbossed. If someone cannot buy you, and if someone cannot boss you around, you are independent. She is making independent decisions, but she's making those decisions on behalf of the people. So let's go back to this page right here and read something. Shirley noticed that people with power and money didn't seem to care about folks who were poor. This bothered her. She remembered how it felt to be poor. So she spoke up and tried to make a difference for the people who didn't have power or money. On this page, which we read earlier, it shows Shirley speaking up for her local community. This is before she ever ran for any office, any public office in the government. She's showing her quality of character. From the very beginning, she spoke up for people and continued to do so until she finally landed in the state assembly. Let's figure out how far this goes. Oh boy. Shirley's taking it all the way to the top. There's a big backdrop and Shirley's standing in front of it. It's a blue curtain. There's a sign on the side that has a slogan and there's a seal behind her and the big red and white seal says Shirley Chris Holm for president. To the left of that is the poster, her campaign poster, and it says bring us together, but us is spelt like U.S., like the United States. Vote Chris Holm, 1972, unbought and unbossed. She's very spunky. She's got a lot of spirit. We'll see how this goes. It's very hard to run for president. It's very hard to run for president. While in Congress, Shirley gave many speeches, and people of every color and background liked her ideas for change. But Shirley wanted to take her message to an even bigger audience. So, in 1972, she decided to seek the highest political office in the United States. Shirley was the first black person, Democrat or Republican, to run for president. Shirley's campaign was full of ups and downs. Although many people helped her and followed her on the Chris Holm trail, the support wasn't enough. Shirley didn't win the election, but her work per paved the way for the future, the, for the first black president of the United States, and one day the first woman president. Shirley Anita St. Hill Chris Holm opened a door to history. Now here's something important. Just because she lost, does it mean that it wasn't a worthwhile experience? No, I think it was very worthwhile for her to try because a whole new audience got to hear her ideas and listen to her speak and see what her values were. And because of that, that whole new audience was exposed to what Shirley Chrisholm believed in, her beliefs. They were exposed to her beliefs. What that means is a whole new group of people got to hear what she thought, what she felt, what she believed in, which is very powerful for spreading a message of change. That's what Shirley Chrisom believed in in 1972. She believed in moving things forward. It's very powerful. All right. So even though she lost, it wasn't meaningless. We're at the end of the book. These are some images. I'm not going to read this section to you, but what I am going to do is point out some images. Here's Shirley Crystal when she's young. It's a black and white photo. Here's her with her husband, Conrad. And here's her being sworn in by a judge, an officer of the peace. 
and she is being sworn into office for Congress. This is when she was the first black female congresswoman, and he's swearing her in. And then this is her running for president. On the next page, this is her with some other prominent civil rights figures, her and other political leaders, and then a garden shed. It's a large shed, not a small one, that has a mural painted on it with Shirley Chrisholm's face celebrating her. Here are some sources which show you where the information came from. That's useful. And here's a photo of Catherine Russell Brown, the author, and here's a photo of Eric Lasquez. Thank you for hanging out with me while we read the Shirley Chrisholm book. I have some things that I want to talk to you about. Let's think about ethics for a moment. Ethics is a term used to describe right and wrong. It's a system of good and bad, fair and unfair. If something is ethical, it is fair. Shirley was motivated by her sense of ethics. She thought that it was only ethical and that everyone has a chance to speak their voice and participate in government. That's why she spoke up the way she did on behalf of the poor and downtrodden. It was her ethics. She then used that system of ethics to motivate herself and the people around her to make a change. That change occurred when she ran for Congress, was elected to the United States Congress representing the state of New York, and she made changes in Congress to benefit the people. This is very powerful. This is how ethics can support change. However, there are some situations where maybe ethics aren't always the best choice for making change. Sometimes you have to rely on something else called morals. There's a time for an ethical choice, and then there's times for a moral choice. And ethics and morals are not the same. Ethics are informed by social agreements. Morals are informed by religion. We're going to read a book in the next video where they will mention a little bit about religion. And the book is about a man named Johnny Cash, who was a gospel singer. We're going to hear about how some of his ideas were influenced by religion. He was a moral individual, and Shirley Chrisholm was, for the most part, ethical. We're going to talk about those two systems and how they work together, how you can use morals and ethics to make a very fair and equal society. For now, I really appreciate you listening to me. This was a very long video, but I appreciate you maintaining your attention the entire time sticking around, hanging out, and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks a lot and take care. Lion Sight. Regular updates on blind and visually impaired tutorials will be available for all kinds of topics. Thanks for watching.